Hi, thank you ever so much for joining us. I think we're ready to start now. We've got our technological issues are over, hopefully, for the day. Thank you, fingers crossed, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, my name's Elaine Willett. I am the Historic Environment Principal Advisor at Natural England. We'll get to that in a little minute. Um, and welcome to the In Our Nature session uh, today. We will run through the, uh, the broader agenda after an introductory <coughs> session from myself and uh, my colleague David. So, a little bit of an introduction to who I am and who my team is at Historic England. So, uh, Historic England, Natural England, excuse me. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Natural England is the government's statutory advisor for the natural environment and has a duty to conserve and enhance English landscapes as well. So uh, the historic environment work that Natural England does is all kind of embedded within the, um, the, the join up of all of those different um, elements of delivery. The team that we've got has at times been uh, much smaller than this, but uh, recently we've, we've been able to expand our historic environment team. So this is our team of historic environment experts that are spread across the organisation. I won't go through it in any great detail, but just so that you've got some kind of names and faces, um, that there are groups of us dotted around the organisation, um, some focusing on uh, our science and evidence base, uh, around the historic environment, some focusing on the kind of operational delivery of our HE work, and some within my team uh, focusing on the strategy and government advice, so advising uh, government departments on the policy implications around historic environment, um, particularly in relation to nature conservation strategy. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Robertson. I'm one of four archaeologists working for the Forestry Commission in England. Um, I work in the park called Forest Services. Um, you can see the four of us on the screen there and mustn't forget Lauren Shaw who works for Forestry England as well, part of the Forestry Commission family. Um, I've, I've got a national remit, my three colleagues have area area remits and we deal with everything that everything where the historic environment, archaeology and forestry interact. So we advise on policy, we work on guidance, we work on regulations. Um, through to training and um, casework as well. We do lots of casework. And our team has grown um, hugely in the, the last few years. A year and a half ago, there was half a archaeologist within forest services, and we're now up to three and a half. And that reflects the government's ambitions for woodland creation. So hopefully we're going to provide an interesting, thought-provoking session for, for you today. The aims, what we're looking to cover during the day, are on the, on the screen at the moment. Take that off. Um, we've got um, four pre-recorded talks, um, but the people who've recorded those for us are going to be available on, online to take, take questions from the room and, and from online. And we've got three, three live presentations in, in the room. Um, Elaine and I are the first one of those, and we've got two spaced out, spaced out through the day. Um, what Elaine and I want to do is raise a number of issues that we think will, will run through the day. And we're hoping that we'll provide a series of, of ideas, thoughts. We're hoping it'll be a thought-provoking um, start to the day. Um, we may well be slightly provocative in some of the things we say, partly to help discussion and try our best to talk over the, over the cups that, that are going <laughs> past the window. Um, we're very aware that we both work in England, so we're very much going to present an English perspective, um, but that's hopefully going to be balanced through the rest of the day when we have presentations from across the UK, across um, Europe and further afield. Our first presentation will come from, from Sri Lanka. So, um, preaching to the choir in, in this particular audience, but I thought uh, it would be useful for us to start off with a few basic definitions so that we're all working from a, a similar kind of baseline in terms of the, the terminology that we use. Um, it's obvious to, to everyone in this room what the historic environment is and what it's made up of, but it's always worth us going back to basics, particularly when we're talking to audiences that don't come from a professional historic environment background. What is it that we're talking about? It's not just archaeological sites and monuments. It is all aspects of the environment that result from the interaction between people and places over time. It's everything. And really interestingly, from my perspective, working at Natural England, that includes all the physical remains of past human activity. It doesn't matter whether it's visible or not, doesn't matter whether it's terrestrial or not. Um, it can be landscape features, it can be planted or managed flora. 
this will become important in a moment. When we talk about landscape, we're talking about areas that are perceived by people uh, whose character is a result of the action and interaction between natural and or human factors. Again, it's extremely broad definition that pretty much encompasses everything, um, certainly within an English context, um, but much further afield as well. It's really important for us to remember that landscape is a basic component um, of, oh, sorry, natural and cultural features and heritage are basic components of landscape. They're two of the, the building blocks of all landscapes. So nature. There's no formal definition of nature. Nature, like the term heritage, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And this is part of some of the issues that David and I find repeatedly in our sector, um, is that you can be talking to people about nature and be speaking across purposes. Natural England has defined it for Natural England's use, but only within the organisation. This definition doesn't necessarily go further than our own organisation. And it specifically includes historic and cultural connections with nature and the other opportunities that we have to connect with the environment. So the people and place elements of nature and landscape as well. It also, of course, encompasses natural beauty and habitats and wildlife and geology and landscape itself. It's an extremely broad definition. So when Natural England talks about nature, it talks about the historic environment. It just doesn't necessarily name drop it, which is where we can sometimes come a cropper. So how does the historic environment and nature fit together? Are they two separate entities that coexist side by side, or are they, as I would see them, entirely one in the same thing? Our view at Natural England is that the historic and natural environments are indivisible. They are absolutely one in the same. You're talking about the same features in the same places, viewed perhaps with slightly different lens, valuing slightly different facets of that asset, um, but ultimately the same stuff out there. All English habitats and all English landscapes are anthropogenic in origin or at least very heavily influenced by anthropogenic influences over the millennia. England, and I specify only England, does not have any natural habitats with a capital N, devoid of mankind's influence. So when we're talking about the historic environment also reflecting managed flora, we're talking about every inch of every habitat in England, and we're talking about every inch of every landscape in England as well, as being underpinned by a historic environment. So it really is ubiquitous and it needs to underpin the work that we're doing in any environmental intervention. Um, the historic environment clearly underpins environmental character and quality and function of fabric and the way that our world works out there. It's entirely um, influenced by the time death, by what has happened there in the past in a particular place. And as we all know, it can provide really powerful connections between people and place, um, equally powerful, sometimes even more powerful than the traditional tr interpretation of nature. Um, and, of course, our historic environment provides us with our scientific basis for evidence-led decision-making around what we do next with our environment. It's a key component of sustainability, given that our historic environment, nearly all our elements of our historic environment, are finite and non-renewable. You cannot have a sustainable solution, environmental solution, without considering the sustainability of the historic environment and the impacts of your interventions. So... I wanted to just very briefly cover the different roles that the, the organisation, the different sectors, um, with, well, different elements within our sector kind of play. We have central government, so particularly um, departments like DEFRA and DCMS, but also DLUC and others who um, set policy and set the law ultimately around uh, heritage and our historic environment. They also set um, kind of driving policies like DEFRA's 25-year environment plan. They undertake... Um, you know, statutory reviews like our landscape review um, and things like that. So they set the overall tone and direction of travel. Heritage Statement, for instance, coming out soon um, from DCMS. Then we have the arm's length bodies, such as the ones that David and I come from, that are effectively the quangos attached to some of those government departments. Um, you'll see very different working cultures from one, work, one department to another, actually, and again, that adds to the, uh, the, the colour of our work, I would say, <laughs> and the interest of it. So when different um, heritage arms length bodies are coming at things from slightly different perspectives, it can be a product of the fact that they're placed in different parts of government, effectively, with different aims and different objectives. 
Um, then we've got local government, of course, who completely underpin all of the local knowledge and expertise and advice and provision of, of guidance and bespoke advice on the ground. Um, also, of course, handle all the, the planning related issues, um, but that's less, of a, less frequently related to our area of work. I've put third sector and land owning trust because you've got um, actors out there like the National Trust or English Heritage who hold their own SMR or HER. They have that kind of slightly curatorial aspect to them, albeit again influenced by their own organisation's direction of travel. And then we have consultants and contractors who are the, the people out there on the ground doing the work, leading the field survey, gathering the evidence, analysing the evidence, synthesising it, assessing it, and very frequently informing decision making on the ground. Thank you. So we're going to spend a lot of the day talking about nature-focused projects. And one of the themes that we're going to pick up on, I think, throughout the day is how many of those sit outside the planning process. Um, it's possible, or it, it does happen, that some nature-based projects need planning permission. They might be considered engineering work, so they have to go through the, through the planning process. But the great majority of nature-based projects don't go through the planning process. They sit outside it. Um, and because of that, um, national planning policy framework doesn't apply to, to the majority of them. Instead, there's a um, series of um, different policies, different regulations, and different suites of guidance that, that apply. Um, if we take um, forestry and agriculture, we're looking at the environmental impact assessment regulations for forestry and for agriculture. Um, we can look at consent systems as well, um, including the SSSI, the Sites of Special Scientific Interest um, consent system. Um, there's the open habitats policy as well. Um, and guidance, some, some of these systems have, have guidance associated with them, such as the UK Forestry Standard, which applies to all woodland of all types across the four nations of, of the United Kingdom. Um, and one thing that we might want to discuss as we go through the day is um, how these regulatory systems, the guidance systems, potentially handle the historic environment in different ways to the planning system. Um, Elaine and I have been talking about, you know, is there a difference between, between planning, which has a presumption in the favour of sustainable development? You know, in a rural context, how often, do, how often do planning applications have to avoid significant archaeological remains? You know, nationally significant remains, yes, but, but the great majority of de undesignated, non-designated heritage assets, does planning say those, those have to be avoided? Um, if you look at forestry, in the UK forestry standard, it's very, very different. The principle, the overriding principle in there is that you avoid known significant heritage assets. So it goes right down to the level of individual field walls, individual hedges, um, individual banks, and they need to be avoided in forestry schemes. And I've put two photographs on the slide there to, to try and demonstrate that. The top one shows a... Um, Round barrow in a, in a forestry context, in a plantation which is in open space, that's a scheduled round barrow, so it probably would be avoided as part of a planning development if there was, if there was one there. But the site at the bottom, that's the excavation of prehistoric ring ditch with associated Bronze Age cremations. That wouldn't be avoided in a, in a planning context necessarily. You know, in this case, it was, was excavated ahead of a development. Forestry very much would avoid that. That would be you know, not somewhere that, that new trees, new woodland was, was created. Because of the um, overwhelming public benefit of nature-based projects, there are a whole series of incentives that apply to them, and public money being spent to, to recognise the, the public benefit that they, they bring. Um, and I've listed on the screen there a whole series of the um, incentives that apply to, to forestry. I've divided them into um, four, four different sections. Um, the top three are Forestry Commission grants that apply in England offering um, funding, grant funding for, for woodland management, for woodland design and woodland creation. Um, and then the last one, 
I couldn't list however many um, grants there are related to, to woodland that the Forestry Commission doesn't administer because the Woodland Trust has many, community forests have many, local authorities have many. There's, you know, there is literally tens, if not, not hundreds, of those grant schemes available for, for woodland nowadays. The good news is that all of those consider the historic environment, sometimes in different ways, but, but they do consider the, the historic environment. So someone applying for countryside stewardship, either a woodland management plan or, or countryside higher tier woodland only, will need to collate information on the historic environment assets they hold. And grant funding will be available. There are now historic environment options available through countryside stewardship higher tier. Um, someone who wants to create woodland, again, they need to, if they go through Woodland Creation Planning Grant, they need to collate information on the historic environment. They can have a £1,000 grant to do their baseline checks, to bring in information and advice. And if archaeological surveys, specialist archaeological surveys are needed, they are able to apply for supplementary payments for, for funding for that. Um, interestingly, though, forestry handles what we might consider as archaeologists desk-based assessments in a different way to planning in that the onus is on the applicant to gather information, gather advice and present that on application forms rather than being expected to ask a specialist to write a desk-based assessment on their behalf. So a little bit of background into some of the other agri-environment um, incentives. Um, it, it might surprise some people to know they've, they've been around for a very long time, actually. The agri-environment scheme started off in the mid-1980s, um, predominantly with a wildlife and landscape uh, perspective. But landscape has been in the mix um, in even the very earliest incarnations of agri-environment scheme um, for a very long time now, which in and of itself will have had positive impacts on the historic environment. Um, Fundamentally, well, agri-environment schemes exist for all sorts of reasons, but fundamentally they're introduced to uh, begin to address the impacts of the post-Second World War agricultural intensification. And some of those impacts are around the financial stability of farmers and the market out there, some of them around the environment, some of them are around socioeconomic um, support, like hill farm allowance, kind of recognising the some of the cultural heritage and the socioeconomic in interests in specific parts of the country. Um, so there's a, reason, there's a range of different reasons why, why agri-environment schemes have sought to subsidise, incentivise or otherwise financially support um, different works out there in the farmed environment. Um, they've typically, as I say, focused on biodiversity and landscape, but post-2005, um, historic environment was very clearly named as a primary objective of these schemes, and historic environment despite the fact we might refer to it slightly differently in terms of objectives, is still absolutely in the mix um, and, and named objectives within the current countryside stewardship, CS schemes, and also um, as we move forward into the government's new scheme that is de developing environmental land management, ELM. Um, there are other agri-environment schemes out there. One example, Nature for Climate Peatland Grant Scheme, um, which my colleague Kat will mention later. Um, is, is another style of scheme specifically seeking to um, deliver landscape scale peatland restoration works, um, predominantly for climate change and carbon sequestration purposes, but clearly there are considerable historic environment benefits that we will be gleaning out of that if it's done right, which is the key. Um, fundamentally, we have moved away over the years from um, systems that pay landowners and land managers and farmers money for owning and farming land, simple as that. Um, we're absolutely moving away from those kinds of concepts into uh, a much more, um, what's the word? Uh, we're expecting the delivery of public goods and services for the public money that, that landowners may well receive. And that's part of the contract. So we are raising the bar very considerably. So we, the government is raising the bar very considerably around what it expects for the public money that, it's being, that is being spent um, out there in, in the environment. Um, it's a fact that many in this room will be painfully aware of. The vast majority of historic environment features out there beyond a very built heritage urban context for the vast majority of all the other historic environment features, be them designated or otherwise, the risk factors are addressed by putting the right habitat in the right place. That is fundamentally what's going to see them conserved, enhanced, preserved um, and better interpreted. So that is an in and of itself a nature-based solution, which we will get to in a minute. 
Um, integrated management is a phrase that we use that talks about effectively paying for a single environmental intervention that gets you not just a single environmental outcome, but two, three, four, five, lots of environmental outcomes. And um, we speak a lot about integrated management, not just on a value for money, the FM perspective, um, because it makes good sense, good financial sense, um, to integrate our management, but you avoid those unintended consequences of running a biodiversity-only project that then happens to come a cropper from a historic environment perspective or vice versa. Um, it doesn't make sense. In truth, the climate and biodiversity crisis is so great and the, the need for change is so urgent now. We don't have time to be doing one thing at a time. We need to be combining forces and integrating our management, um, which can take a bit of time at the outset, but ultimately delivers the type of long-term permanent change that we need to see in our environment for all sorts of environmental reasons, heritage being just one of them. Some of the values around the historic environment um, can be recognised in different models. No model is perfect, and I will hold my hands up instantly and say that. Some of the models you might be familiar with are around ecosystem services, natural capital models, culture and heritage capital models. Um, when used well, I think they have a huge um, opportunity to begin to integrate historic environment thinking and consideration into a broader environmental discussion, um, but they do need to be done well. So as I say, um, again, I suspect I probably don't need to convince anybody in the room of the climate crisis or biodiversity emergency that we're experiencing, but it, it, go, it does go, you know, it's, it's worth saying, it's worth revisiting. Some, uh, the IPCC report um, recently states that some of the key risks in Europe, at least, of climate change include increased mortality and morbidity of its human population, ecosystem changes due to excessive heat, um, drought and crop stress, uh, water scarcity, flooding, ironically, um, and sea level rise. The pace of change is the thing that's really um, demanding the urgent action from an environmental intervention perspective. 15% of species threatened with extinction across Great Britain at the moment, 133 species already extinct. 41% um, of species have declined since 1970 when detailed records were began. Um, and 240 non-native and invasive species having serious adverse impacts on our environment. And some of them will be having a serious adverse impact on our historic environment as well as our biodiversity and habitats. <coughs> so what are we going to do about all of this? Um, from Natural England's perspective, we're focused on developing and delivering nature-based solutions. And this is the definition, which I shan't read out, of nature-based solutions. It pretty much covers everything you might want it to cover. Um, it's a very detailed definition, but some examples of uh, nature-based solutions could include these things, and I put them up as they're kind of slightly jargon-tastic terms that you might come across in various documents, um, where historic environment has, A, something very much to offer these nature-based solutions, and B, something to get out of them. So I would call everyone to arms to... Um, to really engage productively with these and other initiatives that are out there. So the Nature Recovery Network is an overarching um, product of the Environment Act, ultimately, um, and we'll use lo na local nature recovery strategies as a statutory ins instrument for delivering the Nature Recovery Network. One of the four objectives of the Nature Recovery Network is around conserving and enhancing the historic environment and cultural heritage. Um, so that's really important that when we're using the word nature in Nature Recovery Network, we mean historic environment as well. But you're not necessarily going to see the words historic environment, archaeology, heritage even name dropped in there, um, which can mean it's easy to kind of pass it by and assume there's not a lot to, to be gained from it. Um, there are plans for species reintroduction um, across the country. There's opportunities there that the historic environment can be um, extracting from those projects and also opportunities for us to improve the quality of those projects and to inform the decision making that goes into them. Biodiversity net gain is uh, a concept on the back of the Environment Act that is being developed at the moment. It's still very much a work in progress, but we're working really hard to integrate historic environment into that. Um, and to ensure that, again, not only does heritage get something good out of it, but also it contributes something to improve biodiversity um, on the, in those projects. We have 
whole new, slightly mind-bending uh, markets developing that have never existed before around green finance and carbon credits that will be, um, will be developing outside of a regulatory framework. This is about the market taking responsibility for the damage it's causing and generating profit from the planting of trees or the restoration of habitats. And it isn't necessarily something that any department of government has got a tight grip on. That's not the point. The point is to let the market do it itself. Um, and that's, that's brand new territory for everyone in this room, I think. Um, I would, love, I would love to see the opportunities that come out of that. There are, of course, constraints and issues that we would all want to deal with as well. But um, let's focus on the positives. There's a lot of money out there, and I'm sure we, could, um, we can contribute to the best quality informed decisions being made on the ground. Thank you. Um, for those people online, we're, we're running a little bit behind, so um, we'll probably move on to the next talk in about, about five minutes' time. So I'm just going to zip through some of some examples of, of nature-based solutions, and the first ones I'm going to talk about are, are Heathland, um, and they can include Heathland recreation. So this is where Heathland used to exist, but the land use has changed, and people want to return it to, to Heathland. And the example I've chosen there is a is a forestry plantation that was planted in the 50s on Heathland but has been clear, clear felled now to restore Heathland and that needed to go through the um, EIA forestry regulations process and th the open habitats policy was applied to that. Um, the person you can see is stood on top of a burial mound that was identified and protected as part of the project. Um, but Heathland work can include restoration such as scrub removal, scrub management, bracken management, but also ground disturbance. And the example we've got on the screen there is where um, the litter layer was removed to expose soils beneath in the hope that Heathland plants would, would regrow. Um, it can involve woodland creation as well, and two main methods of, of woodland creation. Um, tree planting, you know, the physical planting of the trees in, in the ground by people, and sometimes um, holes being dug mechanically, and that's, we've got an example there from the, from the Peak District. Um, but it can also include natural regeneration, where the land is left for natural succession to take place to allow scrub to develop and, and hopefully woodland in, in the long term. And both have really, really important roles to play in, in nature-based solutions, but also in terms of meeting the government targets which have been set for, for woodland creation, which include 180,000 hectares of new woodland in England by the end of um, 2042. Um, it can also include agroforestry, which involves the planting of, of trees either in arable landscapes or in grassland landscapes, often in linear, linear lines. Um, Next thing we want to talk about is the opportunities that are out there for the historic environment and the historic environment sector. I think because more and more nature-based solutions are going to be happening over the next few years, there's huge potential for the historic environment. In terms of protecting individual historic features and historic landscapes um, through avoidance or, or even better management through, through, through enhancement. So if someone creates new woodland, they might be encouraged to manage the um, historic features they've got more effectively. They might be able to get money, tap into money that they've not been able to get before to, to look after those historic features. So, so really, really strong chances of enhancement. And on top of that, we've got restoration possibilities. And the example that I've included on the screen here is of a woodland that was there in the 19th century, shown on historic maps, but Google Earth images show that it's not there anymore. So that's a really, really good possibility for planting woodland again and therefore recreating the historic environment, the historic landscape. And we mustn't forget public access and the benefits that access, um, lifelong learning, um, well-being that can come through through nature-based solutions if we install permiss if we install permissive access or um, interpretation panels or online interpretation, the whole range of, of options that are there. But there's also opportunities for the historic environment sector as well. Um, you know, there's opportunities to become really, really familiar with the, the legislation, with the regulatory framework, with the guidance that exists for, for nature-based solutions and for historic environment professionals to provide advice, whether they're local authority curators or contractors or consultants based on that. Um, there's a growing market for specialist surveys as well. The more, 
more projects that happen, the more archaeological surveys are going to be needed, um, whether that's level one um, analytical surveys like the one on the, the left-hand side when you look at the screen, or geophysical surveys like the one on the right-hand side. And there's also the opportunity to use new technologies, and we've got two papers coming up today which will talk about those, so I won't, won't go into any more detail. Um, so I think I'll wrap through this slide very quickly. Uh, there's some examples on here of some of the uh, documents, the guidance that includes um, historic environment chapters or historic environment standards, effectively. Um, that, so, for instance, the one on the far right-hand side, as you look at the screen, is around a historic environment standard we have set for the Nature for Climate Peatland grant scheme. Um, you know, it sets a very high baseline for what every application needs to do in terms of assessing the historic environment before uh, you'll be considered for, for the grant scheme um, in the first place. So in terms of the different ways of thinking, um, I th there's a discussion to be had, I think, after this session around um, what those different ways of thinking are. The polluter pays principle doesn't it naturally apply in this context. The way in which these works are funded, be them through public funds, um, and the delivery of public goods and services for public money, all through those emerging markets around green finance, is very different from our traditional ways of thinking of things uh, that kind of have been developed over the decades on the concept of polluter pays. And I think that some of those um, some of those underlying principles need will will have an impact on the way in which we think about these proposals as they come forward and how we integrate the historic environment opportunities um, that are out there. Um, I put this as a question. Does the sector have a skills gap in this area? I know I feel like I have a skills gap, but I can't speak for anybody else. I think that the pace of change, not only in terms of the climate emergency and the biodiversity emergency, but also in the pace of change in terms of our, um, our solutions that we're proposing to it and all of the work that's going on at the moment to try to address some of the worst impacts of those things, is so fast. I've never, I've never lived through. I don't think anyone has lived through a, 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 anything like it, actually. Um, and particularly within the Defra family, you know, we've had three very significant pieces of legislation go through in the space of a year: um, the Agriculture Act, the uh, Fisheries Act, and the Environment Act. Uh, all of which have considerable impacts for the historic environment in one way or another, and considerable opportunities, actually. Um, and more is to come. Um, yeah, it's a really exciting time, but everything is moving very, very quickly. I would suggest that these new opportunities that are, are opening up to us, both within uh, the public sector but also within the private sector, will probably require new skills, um, particularly the ones that strike me as, as neat. We, you know, I include myself in this, we all need to get... Um, really, really good at being part of a team that integrates the management of the historic environment alongside everything else out there in the, in the environment. So new approaches to risk versus reward, again, moving perhaps away from a polluter pays principle where that isn't legitimate to, to kind of hang on to, um, ensuring that we're our understanding the, the actual impacts out there in the real world of what's being proposed are evidence-led, which can be really difficult. Um, in some circumstances, and that kind of cross-discipline collaboration where in order to tailor our historic environment advice, we need to know rather a lot about the habitat, the restoration technique, the kit they're using on site, what it's going to be used for, how it's going to be managed, the longevity of the habitat. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we might not necessarily as a sector have a really good grasp on at the moment um, that's kind of part and parcel of us being able to tailor our advice to get the very best out of the opportunities that are in front of us. Um, I would say that our overall aim within Natural England, from a historic environment perspective, across all of the opportunities that we've discussed here, is around minimising the risks to the historic environment and maximising the opportunities, and that's what we're here to do.